Today's violence, a, a bit of a social analysis here. Since we first invented culture 11,000 years ago with the development of agriculture, violence, even in those simple hunter-gatherer societies, violence tended to be the drug of choice. Domination over here and there, that you had to work in bands and so on. But since we invented civilization, violence has escalated through the centralization of power. And what improvements come with civilization? Violence has escalated. So I want to point out uh, this one point of view of social analysis called shock doctrine. I'd like to do a little summary of, of what this means and that's operating. It's so one frame of reference of looking at what's happening. Milton Friedman was an economics professor at Chicago University. And he uh, uh, really became the grand guru of the movement for unfettered capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism. You know? uh, he wrote the rule book for what is happening with this globalization of the economy and the shock doctrine. States sole function. What is in, in this view? To protect our freedom from outside enemies, but read the very rich and powerful. Protect, quote, our freedom from outside enemies and from uh, uh, dissension from within, meaning us times. Yeah. Another thing, to preserve law and order, to enforce privatization. Everything is to be privatized. The government has to get out of the business of running anything that, other than uh, you know, protect, protecting us. Privatized contracts and everything. This is what's very radical with this shock doctrine. That means, uh, of course, uh, privatize the, the police and privatize soldiers and privatize everything. Okay, the government should not run anything that can be privatized for the making of profit. So small government, small government, this is what's meant by small government. Anything else including providing free education is unfair uh, interference with the market. Or expecting them to take care of the poor, well that's unfair. You don't take it away from those who make profit. So you cut back social services. Perfecting this strategy, huh? Key in it is waiting for a major crisis because people resist this destruction of any way of life for the majority. They resist that, taking away um, human rights of the citizenry. And so you have to have a crisis. You create a crisis if you can't, you, you seize on any natural one anyway, you create crises with the idea that people get so traumatized with the shock that they can no longer resist. And so key in this shock doctrine is you have a crisis and you, you push through all laws and reforms as quickly as you can while people are in shock. This is Milton Friedman. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling rage toward him, and he's my brother. Uh, uh, this is what it's about. And then you quickly make the reforms you made permanent, because when people kind of come to their senses, say, what have we done? Well, oh my God, the Patriot Act, what, have, what rights have we just been giving away? It's already in place and reinforced. Uh, he observed that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces the real change he's pushing for, because people will resist, unless they are in shock. It's a, ve a variation of Machiavelli's advice that injuries should be inflicted all at once to get your advantage. In the mid-70s, he became advisor to General Pinochet in Chile, the dictator. That was the first uh, country where he thought he could really push this through, and so he did. Pinochet loved the plan. He advised rapid fire transformation of the economy, cut, tax cuts for the rich, free trade, privatized services, uh, 
no deregulation, you can charge whatever you want, doesn't matter how many people go poor, cuts to social spending. Huh? So this thing is called deregulation. We do what you want, unfettered capitalism. There's a connection between economic shocks that impoverish millions and the epidemic of torture. They go hand in hand. One really is a part of the other. You know, like in, in, uh, in Chile, uh, hundreds of thousands punished, put in jail, and tortured, etc. Uh, so it became known as the Chicago School Revolution and Chicago Boys, some of, some of these countries. It was called economic shock treatment. In Argentina, also in the mid 70s, right after that, the disappearance of 30,000 people, you know, who bodies were found, tortured and killed. Uh, anybody who was leftist, uh, challenged things, disappeared. It was integral for imposing the Chicago school policies. In Poland, when solidarity, the marvelous, awesome nonviolent revolution, and solidarity became the new government. They didn't know economics. These had been workers and you know some intellectuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they they were hoodwinked into accepting shock doctrine. And it was a horror. And then they pushed through all kinds of laws. And then when the leaders finally kind of realized the horror and people going poor and people starving and you know, unemployment through the roof, and uh, well, that, that's really the plan. Um, things were in place. Um, the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher was the first in a developed country, as we call it, for first world country, to adopt clearly uh, shock doctrine policies. And she worked at destroying labor unions, really worked at it and uh, with, with some success. Um, the first experiment in a democracy. She set about destroying labor unions. The Falkland War in 82 was helpful in this regard. People rallying, you know, war helps rally people around doing the very thing that destroys themselves. Um, so anyway, Ronald Reagan brought it here in the 80s. Right away, you know, after labor unions, because that's where the biggest resistance comes from, uh, strong labor unions. And so you have to destroy labor unions. And so Reagan, you know, just starting to cut off the legs of the power of labor unions in this country, um, giving tax breaks to the wealthy, just unbelievable. Well, that's what it's all about. In China, in 89, the whole Tiananmen Square massacre you know, the marvelous phenomenon of resistance and the leadership in China choosing to, the, 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 uh, choosing to do the massacre, subsequent arrests of tens of thousands. Uh, so much of the economy was turned into capitalistic kinds of economy with so much of this shock doctrine. In Russia in 93, Yeltsin, uh, Boris Yeltsin decision after he had challenged the old guard. Uh, he, he then ended up sending in tanks and set fire to the parliament building as he incorporated shock doctrine policies, locked up opposition leaders massively in Russia, cleared the way for fire sale privatization that created the country's notorious oligarchs, billionaires appearing in Russia, while people being homeless like it had never been before. Uh, unemployment, poverty, homelessness, that's what it's about. 9-11 here in this country in 2001. Terrible trauma for Americans. And boy, did the Bush administration incorporating shock talk and really take advantage of that. Uh, the Patriot Act, as I mentioned, imports tax breaks for the wealthy. Unbelievably shameless. Couldn't happen in ordinary times. Uh, the people would not have put up with it. Uh, Washington was packed with Friedman's disciples under Bush, including Donald Rumsfeld and so on. Bush team seized on the, quote, war on terror, which is an ongoing thing, ongoing shock. Make sure it's almost completely for-profit venture. The radical economic shock therapy was imposed while this country was still 
uh, of the country of Iraq was still in flames under Paul Bremer. Uh, well, we had a, an MPT exploratory team in Baghdad, uh, Johnny McCoy and I, just couldn't get over on the ground. This is months after the US invasion. Nothing was happening. Nothing was getting repaired. There were no local companies being contracted to rebuild anything. Yet we found out millions of dollars in cash given out to all kinds of people that were really a part of this shock doctrine. Uh, to this day, things aren't repaired. Um, in Iraq, mass privatization, complete free trade is being pushed. Uh, dramatically downsized government, meaning you privatize all kinds of necessary business. When Iraqis resisted, rounded up, Abu Ghraib is a product of shock doctrine, an integral part of it. There's privatization of military bases. The running of bases is run by private companies. Food services run by private companies. Contractors do the war fighting. There are more contractors than actual soldiers. Why? Where are you? People can make money. Why should the government be doing it? Uh, uh, you know, uh, not for high profit. Meanwhile, back here in 2003, the U.S. government handed out 3,500 contracts to companies to perform security functions. Security has become one of these new big industries. In fact, the country of Israel is big on security equipment, etc. They're getting rich off this shock document stuff. Uh, as well. Uh, Homeland Security has issued more than 115,000 such security contracts in a 22-month period. The global Homeland Security industry, yeah, it's over a $200 billion sector in just a couple of years. So, um, so this global war fought on every level Owned by private companies whose involvement is paid for with public money. You know, with the unending mandate of protecting the U.S. homeland to eliminate, uh, eliminate evil here, us, and uh, evil abroad. Uh, it has much further reaching tentacles than the military industrial complex President Eisenhower warned against as he left the presidency. Sri Lanka, 2004, the tsunami, that are really shock doctrine stuff. Uh, New Orleans, I'm not so sure that the levees were not bombed because that is one thing to say the way that the, that the levees broke, uh, oh, people heard uh, explosions. Uh, well, who knows? Is this just wild conspiracy theory? I ain't so sure. That's all I'm saying. I'm not so sure. But anyway, New Orleans, great opportunity. The rebuilding of schools, it wasn't public schools, it was charter schools, because money is to be made. Why should you have public schools uh, when you can really privatize it and make more money, et cetera, et cetera? Trademark demands, privatization of everything possible. Government deregulation. Businesses can charge what they want, do what they want. Deep cuts to social spending. Uh, okay, um, anyway, moving on. So this is the new paradigm. Um, so, disasters are important. Uh, uh, this, yeah, disasters are necessary. Responding to emergencies is simply too hot in an emerging market to be left to nonprofits. Why should UNICEF rebuild schools when it can be done by Bechtel? So this is the idea. So now wars and ongoing wars and disasters are so fully privatized, they're the new market. You know, this is, you can't fail. Disaster is very lucrative. So um, it's a new kind of an economy under Bush that we're going through. It exists apart from one administration to another. Uh, Obama has inherited this. Uh, in every country where Chicago school policies have been applied over the past three decades, what's emerged 
powerful ruling alliance between a very few large corporations, meaning the super rich that run them, and a class of mostly wealthy politicians. Um, you know, I, I always wonder what politicians really understand this shock doctrine, and which ones don't. Tea Party people, do they understand the shock doctrine, any of them? It's kind of hard to know. You just know that it's an upper crust in these categories that really make this thing work. Um, it's a system that erases boundaries between big government and big business. Government is big business. Uh, it's not liberal, conservative, or capitalist, but as someone said, it's corporatist. You know? um, it's an elite secret Citibank memo. In fact, there were three back in 2005 and six. Says we know the secret Citibank memo said that in the U.S. there's no longer democracy. It's become a plutonic. A society controlled exclusively by and for the benefit of the top 1%. This is what Citibank now said. Uh, they now have more financial wealth than the bottom 95 combined. 95% combined. One memo gloated about the growing gap between rich and poor. Of course, their constant concern is the threat that uh, people might demand more equitable share 